host, Alex Garrett. Why not continue this idea of the kids being the future? Why not uh, deal with this idea that we need to make sure they're okay because they are going to take over for all of us when we're old and retired and whatnot? And I think my next guest, Dr. Tanya Crombie, has a very interesting take on this. Uh, Dr. Crombie, firstly, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here today. And your book is Stop Worrying About Your Anxious Child, How to Manage Your Child's Anxiety So You Can Finally Relax. And you've also got Stop Worrying About Your Anxious Teenager, How to Help Your Teenage a Teen Manage Anxiety and Successfully Transfer to Adulthood. So, uh, transition to adulthood. So, let's start with children because there's still a debate about the masking issue. And, and maybe you were inspired by this pandemic to write about helping kids move forward as they have regressed a little bit over the, the last couple of years, haven't they? They have uh, struggled. Our kids, our teenagers, our adults, everyone has struggled with everything that we've all been through over the last few years, for sure. And so, obviously, as a doctor, you've seen studies, you've seen, you've seen actual kids, and, and what are parents telling you that that went into this book? I feel like you had to be motivated by your own practice uh, over the last couple of years also. Uh, actually, the truth of it is I was motivated. Uh, I wrote the book um, prior to the pandemic, and I was motivated by my experience as a parent, <laughs> much more than any um, experience as a you know, as coach who, deal, who helps parents. But um, first and foremost, I experienced anxiety with my own children. I have two children, and I'm both we're anxious in very, very different ways. It presented in different ways. I didn't realize that's what we were dealing with for a long time. And so I wanted to write a book that said, you know what, I have a lot of education in this area. And yet, when it was my own children, I had a hard time figuring out what was going on. And I had a hard time figuring out how to help them and navigate all the different ways that parents are supposed to, all the things parents are supposed to do. And so I wrote a book mainly about that, how to, how to do this as a parent who's just trying to do their best and do all of the things that parents are trying to do. And then the, then the pandemic came along, and it just got even more um, crucial that parents have some tools and skills and help because it's been a hard few years. In a way, maybe it was, you know, it, it was some kind of divine timing that your advice would come through during the pandemic, perhaps. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I did feel like uh, my message, which is the core of my message is these these kids who are struggling with anxiety. It is crippling. It's terrible. It's awful. And these kids are not broken. These kids are going to be OK. These kids have some wonderful strengths. Um, and, you know, the pandemic just was an even better platform to remind people of that. How many kids do you have? And did you see the personality differences uh, that motivated you to write this? And, and how do parents adapt to those personality differences? Uh, yeah, I have two kids, and they are as different as night and day have been since the day they were born. They're a year apart. Um, so they... Um, I have one, and I, if you meet parents or talk to parents who have children who struggle with anxiety, this is what I hear all the time. One of mine is the, the quietly anxious, the one that you don't realize is struggling until it kind of comes out in a question that something they've been thinking about for two weeks. Or, you know, and then you realize this, this child has been thinking and worrying about this for a long time. And my other one was is the kind of the loud in your face anxiety is this you are very aware of what is happening because um, you know they're going to keep you aware of their struggles at all times so I have I had both and had to figure out how to navigate both of those things um, well I, I can how, imagine that you're you're the one that was quiet I, I feel like they would be a little more uh, like, why aren't you paying attention to me? Or did you find a balance to pay attention to both? 
Oh, I felt like that there were many times that I, that was one of, you know, mom guilt. Mom guilt is real. <laughs> and one of my big mom guilt was my, my loud and my face child is requiring so much attention that am I paying enough attention to the quiet one? Uh, absolutely. I would struggle with that and try and find ways to, and because he was quiet, you could easily assume things were okay. Parents today are a little nervous to get their kids tested for certain, you know, autism or ADHD or ADD. Did you have to go through that? Um, we have done different. Yeah, we have done some testing. Um, and I totally understand. Uh, I've heard that from many parents. You know, you don't want to diagnose your child. And I believe this is my personal opinion. This is not every parent has to decide for themselves. Every parent has to weigh, you know, their unique child that's sitting in front of them. He is not my child. So this is just my personal view is the benefit of knowing what your child is struggling with and having a name and having the ability to talk to teachers or doctors or um, school administrators about this is how this is how my child works. This is what I know about my child. Sometimes we, my child may need accommodation, and ha- being able to do that tends to outweigh the downsides of not knowing for sure and not having a, a clear way to communicate. That's all I would say a diagnosis should be is the opportunity to communicate with people who need to know this is how my child works. Beyond that, what I am hugely resistant to and I never want to see happen and why parents don't like to get their child tested, they don't want their children to be, that's all they are. My child is not autistic. My child is a beautiful, perfect, wonderful human being who also, by the way, struggles with autism or with anxiety or with attention deficit disorder. That is not who they are. They are not their diagnosis. They are the diagnosis is just a communication tool. Those kind of things uh, tick me off as someone with uh, a disability as well, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. that I can totally see it that way, too. But you, you want people, if you're the person with the disability or the parent of someone with any kind of disability, they're not the label. Just see them for the, the individual and all the, the magnificent things about that individual. How important is it to calm their anxiety now uh, before it gets too far into, you know, teenage years and adulthood? Um, It's crucial. It's crucial for a lot of reasons. Basically, the tools that we need to manage anxiety are like muscles. And so just like if, you know, we didn't let our children learn how to walk, when they get to be 10, they don't have the muscle strength to walk. So we need, as early as possible, we need to be building um, skills and tools. Again, and that's the language I use. I say, this is how you work. That's how I talk to my children. Because when kids understand this is how you work, these types of things tend to stress you out. Or these types of things make you anxious. Or you are always a little, you, I mean, my, my child who I said was the more, I call her my high highs, low lows child. That she, from day one, was not good if she got hungry. She was not good if she was tired. And so she just has a, she's very sensitive to those little changes in her body. That is how she works. Doesn't mean she's broken. Doesn't mean she's flawed. This is how she works. And so we start building those muscles. Learn to recognize that you're tired. Learn to recognize that you're hungry. Learn to recognize that things are stressing you out. Here's what we do. Build those skills as early as you possibly can because they are going to need them for their whole lives. I'm talking with Dr. Tanya Crombie. And by the way, we're talking about the future. She has a website called guidanceforthefuture.com, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, you got to check that out. Yes, guidanceforthefuture.com. And so can helping a kid's anxiety now make them ready to be a leader in today's world when they get older? Oh, absolutely. I, um, I'm also a college professor, and I teach a leadership class. And that is exactly one of the things I harp on all the time is that a leader has to be able to remain calm even when everyone else isn't. That is a key skill, one, because 
people are looking to the leader to say, hey, is, are things going to be okay? And if the leader's freaking out, I promise you everyone else will freak out. And also, the leader is the one who's supposed to be coming up with, what do we do next? What's the best idea? What's the strategy now? And if you aren't calm and centered, if you are in that anxious part of your mind, you're not making those best wise decisions. You have to stay calm to make really good decisions about what to do next. When we're at the heart of it, it's all about loving our kids and wanting them to be successful and have good lives. That's all we really want, right? Absolutely. Now, through your techniques, have your kids become less anxious or is there still some part of them that has that anxiety in them that you still have to work on day by day? Yeah, we will always, they will always have to work on it. The way I um, tell people about my kids and, and all kids who struggle is, you know, human beings are on a continuum. So some of us, like I have asthma, which just means I don't breathe as well as a lot of other people breathe. I'm on a continuum. I'm on the low end of the continuum. It doesn't mean, you know, I'm broken or flawed. It, that is how I work. So my kids tend to be prone to more anxiety than maybe some other people. It doesn't mean they're broken or flawed, but it does mean just like I have to have things, tools, in case I have an asthma attack, they need tools because they Things will make them anxious at times, and they need to know how to manage it. I have to ask, were either of your kids bullied, or were they accepted by their peers? You know what? I think they probably had all of the above. I think at times, like, my kids have been like, oh, they're the most wonderful, delightful children, and we love them so much. They have both experienced bullying. They have probably both been mean to other kids. Um, you know, they are normal kids like all kids and have probably done all of it. Um, overall, I would say, you know, they had some struggles, but not. Um, but I think they also found their people and found their tribe and fit in. Um, and so it, uh, eventually it all worked out. How old are they now, if I might ask? Uh, my oldest is uh, almost 20. He's a freshman in college and my youngest is a senior in high school. And I I feel like calming that anxiety helped them get there. But I feel that the pandemic has added the anxiety. So I want to really hammer down on that. Um, The masking situation, heck, even the work from the school from home, it threw everybody off, didn't it? And and I'm sure you saw that in your own kids. Oh, absolutely. All of that. Um, The the disruption. um, You know, I had teenagers at that time. And teenagers are the most social creatures on the planet. And to say, hey, you need to stay home and not go do things with your friends, not see your friends at school, um, was extremely, extremely difficult for, for them, for us. My husband was at home. I was at home. It was, yeah, it was a lot. Um, the, the way that I tried to, tried to look for silver linings wherever I could in that situation, um, but it was, it, was not, uh, it was not fun for them at all. <laughs> And to the parents who feel like they're getting mixed messages still, whether to put on masks on kids or not, or the age range of masks, like, uh, what is your advice to them? Yeah, and that is so tricky. I mean, I am a, I'm a person who kind of tries to follow the science as best I can. The science seems to be constantly evolving because this is such a new virus, and it seems to also be constantly evolving. Uh, it seems like it's getting contagious, but maybe not as um, not as, uh, you know, devastating to people if they get it at this point, which and is that going to change tomorrow? I don't know. I think really the message that I would harp to parents, to anyone, to all people is just take a breath and know that it's like surfing. We can't, we want it to be, okay, decisions made, now we know, and it's not going to be like that. We are going to have to keep surfing waves, and sometimes you're up on the top of a wave and it feels great, and sometimes you're going to crash and go underwater and have to climb back up on that surfboard and start over again. That's kind of how life is, and this pandemic is just teaching us to to go with life when we have to. Don't expect us to know what tomorrow is going to bring. As an author now, let's talk about the author's lens of this. Do you adapt your books to include what you've learned in the last couple of years as a pandemic mom, if you will, and doctor, of course. Uh, 
I definitely adapt to my practice. Um, you know, I do coach parents um, on how to how to best parent their anxious child or their anxious teenager or prepare their teenager for college or the next, whatever their next step might be after high school. And definitely we've had to talk a lot about um, the setbacks. Some kids struggled socially when they were at home. Some kids struggled socially when they went back into the school setting. Some didn't want to go back. So we've had to, um, I've had to deal with a lot of different issues with parents trying to navigate the different reactions their kids are having to it all. That has to be a bit heart-wrenching also to hear the stories. Oh, my gosh, yes. Yes, it's heart-wrenching. And what you brought up earlier about, you know, kids who struggle to find their way socially, those those stories are, are very heart-wrenching because, as I said, um, it's our kind of biological design that at the teenage years you're supposed to bond with your peer group you're supposed to be breaking away from your parents and moving into your you know people your own age as your main people and some kids really struggle because of the other struggles that they are trying to manage all right I'm, I'm talking with the author of stop worrying about your anxious child how to manage your child's anxiety so you can finally relax and stop worrying about your anxious teenager, how to help your teen manage anxiety and successfully transition to adulthood. Have people come up to you and said, boy, you know, Dr. Crumby, I've taken this from this book or this from this book and applied it to what we're dealing with right now. Have you gotten those kind of comments? Oh, yeah, definitely. I, I love those kind of comments. I love the. I had one parent say, um, my daughter doesn't know what I'm doing differently, but she knows something is different. And I thought that's so great that the mom is just kind of incorporating this and it's making changes and the child doesn't even know what's going on, but things are better. And that's, uh, that's awesome. Uh, well, can you give us a, any other examples? I'm kind of curious to hear what kind of tips that people, that parents have used from your books. Well, one of the big things that I see and experience myself is there is nothing that creates more anxiety in a parent than a child who is anxious. And what tends to happen is there's this vicious cycle of child anxiety makes parents anxious, which makes child even more anxious, which makes parents even more anxious. Um, and so a lot of the tools that I give in my books are about how do you as a parent short circuit that vicious cycle? How do you stop yourself? And as you stop yourself and get more calm, it's just like that example I used when I talked about leadership. When you stay calm, um, your child feels safer and more calm, and you're able to not react in the moment but respond to what's going on. Because a lot of anxiety in kids looks like temper tantrums and anger and maybe disrespectful behavior to a parent. And we tend to just react to that with anger, whereas if we could step back and stay calm and say, I think this is anxiety, not disrespect, we react differently to our child. And then they are able to recognize what's going on, too. They start the skills, manage it. Oh, I'm, I'm not mad. I'm just feeling anxious right now. That is, uh, that's so crucial. I feel like kids are, at a certain age, just, just made to feel, well, not by intention, but it just is is more like you know, stop grabbing at me or something. I don't know. It just it, it um, they're made to feel like they're wrong for being anxious. I guess I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Because parents are just reacting. Like I said, we're kind of like, why is my kid throwing this temper temper tantrum at a birthday party? Everyone else is doing fine. Why is my child like this? And then if we start getting you know embarrassed or having our own feelings. We don't respond very well to our children, but when we get good at saying, oh, I think I'm going to calm down and now I'm going to respond to my child who is definitely struggling here, then, uh, yeah, we don't make the child feel bad for being overwhelmed at the birthday party or whatever else oh. happens, right? Right. You know, I also know that you just mentioned you're a college professor also, so young adults are getting quite anxious also. And, and what's your message to them? And, and what, alongside the leadership class, which is great that you're teaching that, what are the lessons do your college uh, students take away from your, 
your courses? I, I actually start all of my classes with a lecture on anxiety, even though it's not core to their, the content of the class, but it matters. And I talk to them about if you're anxious, you can't learn. If you're anxious, you aren't going to perform very well on your test. Even a low level of anxiety can uh, change the way your brain is processing information. So how can you learn to recognize when you're feeling anxiety? How can you manage that anxiety to improve your performance now so that when you have to go do job interviews and when you have your boss is angry and those sorts of things, those are all going to make you anxious too. So let's start learning some of these just basic, easy tips that you can do anywhere to calm down and maybe put the phone down away sometimes do you ever do you ever teach that even to your kids like you know your phone can make you a little more anxious if you let it just be all you see uh, in a few given hours absolutely I, we do talk about that but and what they're doing a lot of times is they're using their phone as a crutch to manage anxiety to manage that awkward feeling of i'm just sitting here and it feels awkward. I'm not talking, you know, I'm sitting by myself. I feel awkward. So I'm going to use my phone to manage this awkward feeling or not to notice the awkward feeling as opposed to doing something that helps me feel less awkward. All right. You're a mom, you're a professor, you're a wife. You've, you've probably dealt with anxiety for a long time, even during these last couple of years. How did you yourself manage your own anxiety? I think that's the million dollar question now. I, finally did all the things I've been a coach for almost 30 years now and I've been telling my clients for years to meditate and to practice mindfulness and some of those techniques that are like have been proven over thousands of years to be really great for our brains and our anxiety and our just ability to make good decisions and I had not been doing them myself (laughs) in all honesty I've been telling other people and I finally uh, during the pandemic, that was one of those little silver linings is I was home all the time. So I had, I wasn't, you know, the time that I used to spend driving my car to work, I focused, I spent 20 minutes at least meditating, just in quiet, calm meditation. And it made a world of difference in my own anxiety levels. And I had convinced myself I wasn't a meditator. I just, that was my, what I said, well, it's good for most people. I'm just not, I just can't do it. And the minute that I said, I don't have to do it right. I don't have to do it perfectly. I'm just going to try and it doesn't have to be good. That was the minute I started actually being able to do it. But when you have this idea, like anything, exercise or, you know, dancing or anything, if you're like, well, I can't do it, you're right. But if you say, I'm just going to do it. What is exercise is exercise huh. and do it. Then you can. You've probably been on the go in your practice and, and as a professor that to finally have that downtime to practice what you preached it was a turning point for you. Oh, it absolutely was. It, it was life changing. I say that all the time. It really was life changing. Did you have this moment like, wow, my advice does work. <laughs> Yes. Well, I it, sort of little by little, it came around to that. At the beginning, it was sort of like just desperation. I need something. I'm not feeling calm. I, What can I do? And had that sort of, well, what would you tell your clients to do? <laughs> Go do that. And I did it. And yeah, little by little, I was like, man, this really does work. But obviously, you had some experience in it. So that's how you were able to. So did you at one time meditate years ago when your practice first started or did you have some of the ideas and tools already in your toolbox if you will it just you became so busy you didn't practice them over the years yeah I had taken a class years ago and the professor of the class or not really a meditation teacher had started off the class by saying that he meditated for like two hours every day and he could, you know, achieve nirvana in his meditations. And so the benchmark from that point on to me felt so big that it was unattainable. If I, from day one, when I learned the skill, I was like, but I can never do it for two hours a day. And I'll never achieve nirvana. I don't even know what that is. So I kind of gave up. And like I said, when I let go of all of that and said, I'm going to do it for five minutes. And if that's all of that I do, that's okay. 
that sort of freed me to do it and get better at it. So the restless leg, I feel like I've noticed that a lot more. When someone feels that restless leg coming on, what do you say to them? I would say to do kind of the same thing I'm talking about. It's sort of um, anytime there's something that is um, uncomfortable or a little, um, you know, just not something ideal, like the restless leg or, um, you know, the twitchiness or the things that we sometimes feel when we're just uncomfortable in our bodies, um, is just to allow it to be without resistance, just to kind of notice and feel it and get curious about it and be like, oh, my leg's doing this thing. I'm just going to observe it like a scientist. And when we do that, um, it sort of takes that sting out of it, even if it keeps going. But often by doing that and relaxing into it and allowing it, it goes away more quickly. How about sleep? But we didn't touch on that at all yet. Yet it does seem like everybody's sleep schedule has been absolutely crushed with this pandemic. So what about that aspect of the anxiety? So, yeah, it's, it's, I've been hearing a lot about the sleep and the, um, The thing about our mind is that we, you know, as much as we think we're in control, we obviously aren't in control because if we were, nobody would wake up at two in the morning, you know, worried about whether they left the oven on or whatever we do. And we all do that, right? Um, So what we need for that, I like, um, I use apps or books that are just enough to kind of distract my mind from what it's doing on but not um, something so engaging that I, like, can't drift off to sleep. It just sort of distracts my mind a little bit. So I often will um, listen to something on the Calm app, or I will listen to, like, a professional-type book that's, I don't want to say boring, because, you know, they're great books, but if you're a little sleepy, they might just, you kind of, your mind will just listen to it and drift off. So I like a little distraction to help me sleep. Circling back to the leadership theme, I mean, good sleep leads to good leadership, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. Good sleep, good everything, good health, good uh, mental health. It is so crucial. It is a, it is a radical act of self-care just to prioritize yourself and prioritize your love, your amount of sleep. And I want to leave you with this because I also find my calmness comes from the Lord, actually. And, and Luke 22 says, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious. And that's all you really need to know. That line alone, I think that you're through through you. He's bringing that message out that we don't have to be anxious. We can we can manage this. Yes. Yes. I believe that faith is has been uh, it has been a solace for me as well. And I um I believe in believe the belief that you there's something bigger than us is is a huge source of solace. Um, and yeah, I hope that everyone can find that that peace because it is it is so helpful in in times of loss, in times of fear, in times of uncertainty. So powerful. All right, uh, Dr. Crombie, I've got to have you back on and and continue the conversation uh, and, and leave people waiting for the next uh, next wisdom from you, the next episode. How about that? I would love to come back. This was a great conversation. All right, I'm talking with Dr. Tanya Crombie. She is the author. I'm going to get it right this time, doctor. Uh, the author of Stop Worrying About Your Anxious Child, How to Manage Your Child's Anxiety So You Can Finally Relax. And stop worrying about your anxious teenager, how to help your teen manage anxiety and successfully transition to adulthood. Third time's a charm there, right, doctor? Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And you can find her at uh, guidanceforthefuture.com. And I know you're on social media, so give that plug also. Uh, um, It's Guidance for the Future on Facebook, and it's just Tanya Crombie on Instagram. Well, we will uh, we will look you up there and, and tag you there, and, and thanks again, and, w- and we'll talk to you very soon. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks so much for the conversation. It was great. Thank you, Dr. Crombie. And once again, as the Lord says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious. 
We'll have some more calming voices in the coming days, I'm sure, on Alex Garrett Podcasting. Thanks for listening.